a notice of this meeting has been provided to the Coast Star, the official newspaper of the Borough of Belmar, and the Asbury Fire Press on December 22nd, 2021. A notice of this meeting was posted on the bulletin board of the municipal building. Take roll call, Councilman Brennan. Here. Councilman McKinney. Here. Mayor Olsenberg. Here. Councilman McCracken. Here. Councilman Carvelli. Yeah, here. Thank you, April. Everybody can join in saluting the flag for education. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody can just remain standing for a moment of silence for our troops, their families, all our first responders, and especially for all the first responders that had to deal with uh, the, the 10 people that were in the water at the 8th Army Beach last week. Uh, Nine people were rescued. Uh, they did a great job, but unfortunately, Fernando Perez uh, did not make it. Thank you. Okay, the first thing that we have, if everybody can join me on the dais, we have a presentation from the Women's Club. So if they can come up.
Um, on behalf of um, Chief Tina Scott, for those who don't know me, um, uh, the police duty tour at the Belmar team, um, we have about seven or eight riders that ride from uh, this department with Chapter 10 of the police duty tour. Um, this was um, very much appreciated, and this will go towards our 2023 ride uh, for next year. Um, we were able to, between all of the um, chapters throughout the country, we were able to make a donation of $2 million to the National Law Enforcement Memorial Fund. So, thank you very much. Sure. Department. Yes, but not. <laughs> uh, I'm Chief Jason Downing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with everything going on in this day, uh, we do a lot of training, so I think this is going to go towards a lot of the training we do. Uh, you've seen us out there, you know, actually just before the summer, we were out there doing some beach training, you know, with the collapses and things like that. So this is stuff that we really need to stay good up on. And, this you're, you're, you guys are so important, we hope we never see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I would like to thank the Women's Club. I mean, they're such a big part of our community. Uh, I always appreciate all of our volunteers that, that work in all the different areas, the historical society, and everybody that volunteers their time to make Belmar what it is. So I really thank you guys. Do a great job raising the money and, and uh, donating to all these great causes. So thank you very much. Can we line up everybody? We we'll line up for the future. Can't see Lance, I can't see you. Here we are. Yeah. Thank you very much. Congratulations. All right. Don't worry about it. They also run to the public and the members of the public that were there or that were a part of this assessment program. Um, yes, we did have a public hearing. Green was there uh, as oops, Patrick. And we had a tax collector, tax assessor, uh, representative construction code uh, was there. And um, we explained the overall assessment and improvement project and explained some reasoning behind the delay between the actual construction and the assessment. The ordinance was 2016 when it was initially the initial funded. Ordinance, yes. And it was funded a second time because it was a very positive program. Uh, it's gone on now for a little too long to anticipate an assessment is not going to get some kind of response from the residents. So that is why we have the public hearing to listen to the concerns raised by the residents administratively, uh, cost wise, uh, factually. We listen to everything. We identified people by name, by address. Uh, Frank Sinelli made the uh, opportunity in the next few days following that public hearing to go out and look at the properties of most everyone who had a comment that questioned uh, the actual measurements of their improvements. So we, we accumulated a lot of information when we listened. And what we found was that the initial billing was made at the time of the ordinance. And the initial billing was based on an estimate and that estimate would be a unit price that we expected to come in with a bid and how much square footage or how much linear footage you have for curb or sidewalk of your property. 
and then you make a uh, representation to the property owner and that number then is changed when the actual construction is completed. It becomes what we call an as-built number and it's a final construction number. Whatever is paid to the contractor for the square yards of sidewalk and the linear feet of curbing is what is billed to the property owner. Uh, those numbers were all understood by each of the residents. What wasn't understood was that on top of that there was an engineering assessment and that was based on a number that none of us saw, none of us could really figure how it was calculated or paid. And there was a proposal for the first phase of the project, but there was never a proposal or a cost estimate for the second phase of the project. But the engineering firm was paid for all that work. And it was, I'll, I'll use the word disproportionate. The percentage of engineering fees were disproportionate to the amount of work done. Uh, they represented approximately 30% of the construction cost of the project. Uh, because of that, we stepped back, listened to the comments, thought about the comments, and in my correspondence with Administrator Kirschenbaum, made a recommendation the Mayor and Council considers removing the engineering assessment from the sidewalk assessment, meaning that the property owners would pay merely for the work completed, not for any uh, administrative costs associated with the project. Those costs would be absorbed by the borough as they would in any type of uh, capital improvement project. Uh, taking it a step further, I thought it would be important for all of us to understand what that means when you're looking at these properties. There were 238 properties that were in the assessment program. The construction cost was about $645,000 for the two phases. And the engineering assessment was $192,000. So I looked at four properties just as uh, an overview. What I call the small property with 35 feet of frontage, you would typically do the sidewalk and disrepair or the curbing and disrepair just in front of the property. Uh, a medium sized lot, which is 50 feet. Uh, a medium sized lot or corner, which is 50 feet of frontage with frontage along the side street. And then a larger lot on a corner, which is 100 feet of frontage and maybe the same on, on a corner. Um, and just very briefly, the estimated cost for the small lot was $980. The actual cost was $1,103. That to me makes perfect sense because maybe a little more work done was done. Maybe the actual cost was based <coughs> on the contractor's numbers, were, which were a little different than the estimate. But then the resident got a bill for a total cost, and that included engineering. So you're a resident, you know the actual cost is $1,100 and then you get a bill for $1,432. And you go, why? And Lorraine and I took one for the team, and we came to the public hearing, and Patrick did as well, and we tried to answer why. But it was difficult, because we really didn't have all the rationale behind why it was so high. I've done these before. I've done them before where I only included in the assessment portion my engineering fees associated with the assessment, not with the construction, uh, keeping the overall cost a little lower for the taxpayer. So our thought of uh, considering removing the engineering on this particular property would reduce the bill from $1,432 back to the actual construction cost of $1,103 or a savings of $329. So again, I assessed the other properties. The larger lot, I'll give you, the estimated cost was $5,115. That's 100 by 100 on a corner. The actual cost was exactly the same. So they either did a good job of assessing or it was quite remarkable that it was exactly the same, $5,115. The engineering assessment associated with that was $1,527, which to me is disproportionately high for the type of work that was done. Uh, and really what it, what it entailed was an inspector making sure the contractor formed the sidewalk correctly, poured the, the sidewalk to the proper depth, did the, pro the proper measurements along the front of the property, and then uh, provided that in a certification. Um, that bill would be reduced by $1,527 back down to $5,115, which was probably the number that the resident thought they were going to be billed when they got that second bill from the borough. Uh, really, that's, that's the gist of it. The rationale is that we all thought in listening to the comments that there was an underlying 
uh, disappointment with the project, not because of the construction, because everybody said it was done very well, but because of the administration. And we were admitted at a loss because we had issues that we couldn't control. We were ready to go in 2020, and COVID hit, we weren't able to have a public hearing. We had actually had correspondence trying to schedule a public hearing at that time, and then it got pushed and pushed and pushed, and we looked bad because it took two years to get that public hearing held, when in fact we just really couldn't do it in a two-year time period. So here we are, a bit of a mea culpa. We understand what we have to do. It has to be done, but we're asking the mayor and council to consider this reduction in the assessment so that we give something back to the residents so they don't get burdened with uh, an assessment that we felt was a little uh, un unbalanced, I'll say. And I'll be glad to answer any questions, Mayor, Mayor and Council. Yeah, just to make it clear, you weren't the engineer on this project. No, um, we would have done it differently. Um, Lorraine wasn't the CFO. Uh, Ed wasn't the administrator. You weren't the mayor. Yeah, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first bond, there was a contracted price of about 92000 for engineering. Uh, but there was no, on the second bond, there was no contract to price, they just doubled it and had no mechanism really to pay them what they did. Right? Um, my understanding, and I reviewed all the file information and what the borough had on file, uh, there was a engineering proposal for the first phase, and that was presented, the scope of work was presented. Uh, I have every reliance that that scope of work was completed, but then another thing happened, which was the borough code enforcement had to go out and make the actual measurements to verify the work done. I went out with Frank Sinelli and we inspected the properties together and pro I provided a certification that in fact the work was done. And there were two or three properties we looked at where it wasn't quite accurate and we adjusted them. Yeah, that's correct. Anybody have any questions? For, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, Mr. Bach, yeah, I, I, I know this was done under previous administration, under previous engineer, but you had mentioned that the percent of engineering costs to construction costs was 30%. In your experience, what's a normal um, percentage that an engineering firm would charge for such a project? Uh, I'll answer it this way. Uh, the answer is no, but I'll, I'll answer it this way. On a project like this, it's called a, a unit price bid. You go out to bid to a contractor and say, listen, we're going to have sidewalk all over the borough. You're going to get a value to giving us a lower price because you're going to get more volume to do. And that's how the contractor is going to make his money, keeping his unit price down low. So that's the competitive bid portion of it. Um, there isn't really any engineering design. It's really giving them a list of addresses. And I'm, I, was, I'm, I understood that that list expanded dramatically during the course of the project because people saw the work being done and then they said, hey, this is great. You got a low unit price. If I went to a contractor, I'd pay one and a half times that much. So it was a very positive project. So the engineering done for that, uh, if it was a, a DOT project, like we do our road improvements, we're capped at 15%. We can't bill more than 15% for contract administration and we call it construction observation or inspection. Uh, so no, this is this was definitely on the high side, especially when you consider um, the fact that you hired a mason contractor. He was proficient at this work. He did a great job. Uh, I would tend to think if you ask me now that the construction oversight would be on the, on the lower side because of the value of the work that you got from the contract. So 15%. Plus or minus, maybe a little less than that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. And, okay, so Mr. Bakken, just to be clear, um, so if we waive these fees, the borough is going to absorb these fees. Taxpayers are not going to absorb any of these fees or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the taxes. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just making it clear. I kind of want to find it. When, when we do a road improvement project, for example, um, so typically we'll do that. curbing, Amendment. we'll do handicap ramps, we'll do <coughs> roadway improvements. Um, sometimes it goes beyond the limit of just the road itself. Uh, that, even though we get grants for that, right. that really addresses a certain area of the, of the borough, but it's paid for under a capital improvement bond right. that the entirety of the borough funds. So yeah, this portion of the funding would be funded by the borough budget. 
And so the grants are not available for this year, right? I think you and I spoke about that. It would be um, something that we could look into for the future. Something we could look into for the future. For the future. Yes. Okay. Just being clear. And Lorraine, being very practical, is saying, we have this project. We want to close it out. Right. We'd really like everybody to be happy with the work that was done and be not uh, adverse to paying a reasonable bill for the work that was done. If we can if we can get through that in the remainder of the year and get all this cleared away, then you can consider moving on in the future. So when you have a contractor that, not a contractor, sorry, an engineer that comes in and, and um, charges excessive fees like that, um, that are not customary, and you had mentioned something in your talk too about um, there was a some kind of uh, you you had you have some questions about how the process proceeded. Perhaps there should have been approval by the council, but it's approved by the administration or something like that. I mean, I guess this question is for Mr. Vargas. Like, does the municipality have any? legal recourse on something that was so mismanaged? You just placed me in a very hard position because it's not an appropriate answer that I can provide during a uh, public session. It would be something that we would have to address during executive because it would involve litigation and litigation tactics. Um, I'm going to have to ask you to take that for what it's worth. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so um, when was this program enacted? And when was the first bonding? I guess what I'm trying to get at is when was all of the work done? Between between November of 2016 and April of 2017. Okay. And that's both phases of the yes. both, both bondings? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then so all this work has been done. And it's been paid to the contractor and the engineer. Okay, so this is just we're, we're trying to figure out how to recoup. Um, you know, what Practically speaking, the assessment portion of a project like this is done relatively soon after the construction is completed because everyone is aware of it. I, if I was your engineer at the time and I did this project, I would know what properties were included in it. I would have an idea in my head exactly what the <coughs> dimensions were on those properties. I know it was a lot of properties, but you know where the contractor worked. You directed them to do it. You oversee it. You certify the dimensions. You present all of that to the borough, goes to the tax assessor, goes to the tax collector, goes to the CFO, and the public hearing is held. Practically speaking, the public hearing probably should have been held in 2017 into 2018. It probably should have been there. All right. Um, okay, so if, if we weigh the uh, engineering portion uh, off the assessments, the bills go will start going out right away. At this point, what would happen is if we, the engineering, would have to be done by resolution, which would be presented to the mayor and council at the next session, at which point the committee <clears throat> on the sidewalk assessment would prepare a report that would have to be thereafter adopted by the mayor and council, and then the bills would start coming out. Okay. And one of the <coughs> engineering fees that we're picking up in the budget. These, these engineering fees have actually been paid. So, okay, so just do the bond. So what we're doing now is just assessing based on the work that was done so that the individuals who benefited from the project will be paying the fee. So it's essentially reimbursing the borough for the, the expense that they've already incurred. Mm -hmm. All right. And that money will go to pay down debt? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, what else? All right, I, just a suggestion, and I want to hear what the council thinks. If we pass a resolution waiving the fees so we can move this ahead, um, and then instruct Patrick in to start to look into if there's uh, a legal ramification that we can go after. Um, Mr. Mayor, I do apologize. I'm just asking that nobody 
does comment on any legal ramifications or legal challenges okay. arising during public session. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, I'm going to put a resolution just to um, waive the engineering fees to uh, move the assessment along. <laughs> we have about 50 or 60 people, I guess, was it 50 or 60 in the way? Yeah. And that, that was the biggest complaint was these engineering fees. It, right? was, pro it was approximately, um, I would say 50. 50 people were at the meeting on Thursday night. Uh, the majority of people seemed not displeased with the project as it was completed, but were very upset about the um, the assessment of engineering fees, especially because it was much later than the project was completed. Okay. Councilman Carvelli, you want to talk about that? Maybe. Councilman Carvelli. Yeah, I mean, I think that's reasonable. People contracted for a project, they were given a cost, and then, you know, all of a sudden, yeah. the estimate that they were given is. Not that they were owed. I mean, I think it's reasonable that there are going to be some unforeseen circumstances where there's going to be an adjustment, you know, an adjustment. Um, but this all should have been disclosed in the out front of this up front when this project was rolled out. Okay. That's what okay. Yeah, I agree. They shouldn't have gotten an additional bill on top of what they were already told their fees were going to be. So it does seem unfair to the residents that they should have to pay additional money. So it should be and I know Councilman Brennan is here, but can't say anything because he has sidewalks. I got new sidewalks. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. Patrick, if you want to uh, prepare the resolution, we'll also do that now. Absolutely. I mean, if we want to, we can. Uh, I don't know if the executive are allowed to adopt a resolution on the fly. Uh, we have a motion, a motion uh, to. I guess a motion to waive the collection of engineering fees associated with the cost of the, of the improvement project um, identified under. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Identified by Ordinance 2017 20. Ordinance 2016-09, but prior to the adoption of that ordinance, uh, excuse me, to that resolution, we would have to have a public hearing on it at the appropriate time um, when business matters are being covered later on in the agenda. Right, so we'll do it under under the regular resolutions? Correct. We can, uh, it'll, it'll be a separate item. I can word the uh, resolution for the mayor and council, um, but we'll, we will have to have a public comment um, offer on it. Okay. All right. All right. So we'll, right now we're voting to amend the agenda to add this resolution? Not right now. We're going to be doing that later on. Once we, when we get to the resolution aspects, we'll have a public comment on the resolutions on the consent agenda, and then we'll um, make a motion to introduce a new resolution, um, which I'll phrase, at which point we'll open up for public comment, and thereafter, the mayor and council will um, take a vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else for work out? Anything, anything, anything to carry out? No. Okay. Uh, moving on. Okay, next up we have uh, the budget hearing. So, uh, Rand's presentation for us. And uh, I guess the council can step off and watch the presentation. Thanks, mm -hmm. Rand.
Um, this is a budget that with the uh, guidance of mayor and council, we have been able to um, continue to provide the level of service that residents of Delmar are accustomed to receiving. We've upgraded, we, we continue to upgrade the infrastructure within the borough. We have increased the pay down of debt overall. We have stabilized operations across all the functions in the borough. That would be the general operations, the beach utility, and the water and sewer utility. And we've also stabilized the surplus in the, uh, in the borough. So at this point, Basically, what we have is a, is a budget that provides for a slight decrease in the municipal tax rate. So this would be the third year, I believe, the third year in a row that the mayor and council has had either a zero or a slight decrease in the municipal tax rate, which results in a reduction of your uh, taxes overall. Um, the av total average on a residential property, which includes school tax and county school and library, is uh, $7,862.50. The average municipal rate then is $2,749.90, and that would only be the municipal portion of your tax bill. We've also provided a breakdown of the levy and the percentage of, of uh, the total that each particular function makes up. So county is 22% of your tax rate. Municipal purposes is 35%. The library is 3% and the local school tax is 41% of, of your total levy. We have appropriations set of, uh, are designated across a variety of functions and departments that service the borough, of, uh, the residents of the borough providing for everything from administration all the way down to what we call a reserve for uncollected taxes, and that's a uh, statutory obligation that the borough is required to appropriate in each budget. And then finally, we have a uh, breakdown of all our revenue categories. Basically, we are using additional surplus this year, but we were uh, fortunate enough to replace surplus in 2021 resulting in, in our ability to appropriate additional funds for the stabilization of the tax rate in 2022. Um, our local revenues make up 23% of the budget. State aid is 2%. Uniform construction code is 1%. Shared services agreements, which has seen a, a considerable increase since we've added the uh, EMS services to our shared service uh, protocol uh, profile actually, which is now expanding across additional municipalities, uh, Lake Como, Manasquan, uh, Seeger, and Belmar uh, will be participating in the EMS services. Um, our public and private revenues, which are basically grants, are uh, fairly stable. We, have, we will be receiving an additional $290,000 in American Rescue, Rescue Plan funds for this year. That's consistent with what, we with, with, with what the borough received last year. Um, other special items, then we have receipts from delinquent taxes, our tax, uh, local tax, which is our, our uh, amount to be raised by taxation, is consistent with what it was in 2021. And the library tax is, has increased, but that's based on a formula that we are required to follow that's set by the state. So overall, the budget is increased, but some of that increase is due to the additional uh, shared service agreement, the additional grants that, that we are expecting this year that um, are, are not a standard category of uh, revenue. So overall, I believe that the mayor and council is pleased with what we've presented to them and to you. Um, this is something that we have worked very hard on Execution of the budget is important, and um, this, we feel that we're doing the best job possible to the residents of the borough. Thank you, Mayor.
Thank you, uh, Lorraine, uh, for all your support in preparing this very solid budget for the borough of Belmar, one that really puts our residents first and doesn't con um, uh, doesn't at all um, have uh, any negative effects whatsoever on the outstanding services that our residents are, are used to um, to um, to receiving. Um, you know, this budget appears to keep moving the borough forward to a firm financial standing. But I'm just curious, uh, I think the public may benefit from you giving some insight to, into this. Um, you know, we're obviously ex experiencing um, increased inflation. Okay. Last month was the highest increase since some time early in the, the 1980s. Are you comfortable in your preparation of the budget that the borough is protected um, against um, inflationary costs in the, the coming year? In the preparation of the budget, we took into consideration the external forces that are in play and that are affecting our everyday operations. I can't guarantee that at some point in time we won't have, we won't feel some effect if inflation continues to, to increase at eight and a half or, or higher per month. Um, but I feel confident at this point that we have attempted to accommodate for any of it, for all of the eventualities. I can't, I can't make a guarantee that we're not going to see some impact later on in, later on this year, but we've done our best to offset any of those, um, any of those eventualities, if you will. Um, thank you for doing that. Um, I think just one other question, because I know the members of council have uh, capital expenses. Um, I know that you have, uh, you know, you have to weigh those as a budget officer. You get requests from different department heads to support their capital uh, needs. But, um, you know, in, in your final overall budget, do you feel uh, comfortable that uh, this budget supports um, the capital expenses that our departments may have regarding replacing equipment so that they can continue to provide the exemplary services that they've been doing? I believe that we have appropriately um, taken into consideration all the requests and uh, prioritized them so that we can uh, plan for the future. So if we can't get everybody everything they asked for this year, then we can attempt to uh, provide them with that in the, in the coming years. But what we've done is prioritize by department what their requests are so that this way, uh, again, we can appropriately plan. So yes, I think that we have uh, accommodated all of those requests and some additional infrastructure projects that, that the borough is, is uh, looking to accomplish this year. And then moving forward, we would have obviously different priorities and a lot of it is going to depend on what the ultimate result is of the external forces. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I know I've heard uh, Mr. Allison say uh, several times over my time up here that uh, creating budget is, is more of an art, um, especially with all of the uh, restrictions and mandates and, and whatnot. And uh, the thing that always seems to, to pop out is um, the use of surplus uh, as part of part of the budget and you know I guess as more of a refresher I'd like to hear you know what the mindset is or the thought of the function of utilizing um, surplus in the budget um, and in particular in this year and why the amount that is in there is, is in there um, also just taking note that um, looking at the surplus from the previous years and that our total actually surplus uh, appears to be growing, which is, which is a good thing. Um, so, is that a clear question? 
the goal count the, the goal councilman is to put the borough on a if you will a, a stable platform and by allowing by appropriately using surplus is how we develop surplus in the future so our execution of the budget our anticipation of revenues we're, we're all on the conservative side and um, generally we try not to use more in surplus than we've replaced in the prior year and I think we've accomplished that and uh, that would be our goal going forward is to not use more than we than we've uh, replaced in the prior year obviously the benefit of having surplus is like having a savings account that you can go to to access if some if an emergency comes up so if an emergency arises you want to be able to go and get that extra thousand dollars from the bank rather than take attempting to get a loan that's the same thing that we do with surplus is we use that to provide for eventualities that we may not have foreseen or an emergency that that could uh pop up over the you know the next six months basically that's where we're at with uh, with um, yeah, um, I, I would say that the use of surplus here is very appropriate. Um, uh, over the prior year, our surplus increased about a million dollars, and we're and we're using about three hundred thousand dollars more in surplus this year than we did last year to balance the budget. Um, we have a surplus percentage that's about twenty three percent of our budget, which is getting to exactly where I think that the town should be at. Uh, between 20 and 30 percent is a good number to have according to the bond rating agencies. Um, uh, three years ago, we were only down about 13, 14 percent. So the surplus, to go back to your question, um, Jim, about uh, um, about inflation, well, you know, we can't predict that. So, so, so I know Lorraine has worked hard on trying to put together this budget during a very, you know, rocky time, probably as rocky as I've ever seen it as far as, as, far, as far as the economy goes. And if we don't have enough budgeted for certain items and we and we overspend which is could possibly be because of inflation we know we have surplus to fall back on we know that we have some money in reserves that next year won't be bad because of things that happened this year um, we didn't always have that uh, safety net and we do now um, and that's good um, and, and, and hopefully we won't have to, and hopefully we will return all the surplus again and grow again, just like we've been doing every year for the past three years. So that's that's the point I think that uh, that I was getting at is that the past several years, all the surplus money that you put into the budget has been returned to the surplus. Has been returned and, and has been added and to. And added to. Right. So, uh, you know, as you said at the beginning, you know, that I say it's hard to put this together and, and not science, and it is. Um, you have to be conservative. You have to anticipate revenues that you hopefully will get more than, because that's what you want, and you will budget for expenses that you hopefully won't have to totally spend. The expense side of the equation is a little tricky right now because of inflation. So that is something which is of a concern to any financial uh, planner right now. Um, but again, if we if something goes awry, uh, we have confidence that we have surplus that we can that we can get into next year and, and, and not have a whole lot of pain. Thank you. That's my brother. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank you both for your hard work. I really, and one thing I need to appreciate is the conservative estimates on revenue. And I, I think that it, it it gives me a sense of comfort knowing that, you know, that's the way to go. I like I like to be doing that. And, and honestly, I mean what can I say? A decrease in municipal tax rate it's hard to argue with, right? So uh, I mean you could have decreased it a little more. <laughs> no, I, I I really appreciate it. Thank you for your work. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That's one we can I feel the same. I think you both have worked really hard on this. I know it's a lot of a lot of work, a lot of meetings, a lot of member crunching, and which isn't one of my favorite things to do. So I appreciate all of your hard work and, and explaining it so that it's like we all can understand. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I mean, uh, you know, I know we're budget put out for the year, um, and, and there's there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, there was a few other employees that were added that we didn't have. One of the employees was uh, we had a dispatcher because uh, uh, 
the overtime cost that was for putting police officers on a desk. Um, and then we, the court had um, a part-time person that we made full-time. So I know we increased the, some of the employee costs that I know like, like budgeting for the first day and all that, but we get a lot of that money back. So if you just give us on like a little overall, you know, how we kept uh, a basic flat tax increase to what the budget went up to, just, just so the public understands. <laughs> How we were able to do it. I know there's a lot that go into it, but just overall that, you know. Uh, well, I think a lot, a lot of the increases are offset by revenues because they are in the local agreements. Um, so when you see the number go up, it's like, well, how are expenses so far? up? Well, if you look on the other side of the equation, we do have additional revenues because we're getting in from all these different towns. Um, yeah. Overall, we've we've tried to to be as conservative as possible in in anticipating revenue and in but realistic in appropriating for expenditures. So, we, I really, I'm I I'm, know I'm, I'm a, what, I know I, you know I don't want to get too technical in my in my explanation, yeah. but but essentially that's what we're doing is we're balance it's a balancing act. Right. And I, I mean, it goes up, but we have extra revenues coming in from all different sources, and yeah, I mean, like park model and different different things that, that bring our revenue in to offset the increases that happen. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, just in a real small example on the budget, you have construction code fees, which last year was budgeted 1.2, I think, and you brought it in 1.7, this year budgeted 1.5. So it's three hundred thousand dollar increase from last year's budget that helps offset all our expenses, and I'm sure based on projections um, of the code enforcement uh, that we're pretty co confident. Right. This is yes. Oh, the marina. Okay, the marina. Sorry. So it's the yeah. marina. One. So 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 in that case, the marina has increased expenses, increased revenue, but offset by increased uh, expenses. Both sides rise, but there's no net difference that has to be funded. All right, thank you, and uh, thank you, Lorraine. Thank you for your really hard work, and Bob, you also uh, for keeping us on a steady course. So we, we, we really do appreciate it. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to open it up for questions from the public. Yes. Hi guys, Katrina Classes, B Street. Thank you very much. This is, makes us feel good, makes me feel good anyway. I, I want to just kind of go back a little bit to debt. I'm like a debt freak, I hate debt. And um, a couple years ago, when you guys first got on, I remember you kind of combined all the outstanding bonds that were out there and kind of rolled them up into a big. And they weren't really bonds, they were notes, correct? And notes, kind of like an interest-only mortgage payment, all you do is pay interest. So we were paying just interest on a lot of these notes, right? And so when these were all kind of combined, they went into a more or less fixed mortgage payment. So now we have a fixed interest payment, right? So I looked on, on the budget and I'm pretty excited about the fact that you're paying down our debt and our principal. Um, if my, if what I was looking at was correct on sheet 27, in 2021, um, on the principal payment, we paid $1,225,000 off of our principal. And this year, we're gonna pay $1,285,000 which is a substantial amount, which I really appreciate. And um, also that, and then turn, in 2021, we paid 835 for interest. And this year coming up, we're gonna, we're gonna only, I mean, these numbers are only, I mean, only, but it's going down the interest payment to 749,000, which is also a great thing. 
I really appreciate that that was rolled into a fixed payment because interest only does none of us any good. And now we all know that the interest rates are rising rapidly. And if we had been back with those notes and needed to be being really even worse shape than we are now. So, I mean, we're, we're improving all of that, correct? Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're resting on my notes here, actually. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to piggyback on that, and if you really want to get excited, this will excite you very much. I like to get excited. Um, what, we could have continued this, the process of uh, relative interest only. Um, there is minimum payments that have to be in there, so we'll just backtrack. When these uh, people took office, we were paying down about seven, seven to eight hundred thousand dollars um, in in principal payments. Now we are up to one point three, so we're almost doubling what we're paying down. <clears throat> and when we rolled those notes into the fixed program back in December of nineteen. Um, I just did a check with, with, with the financial advisor uh, last week. I said, well, if we waited and did that now, what would be the change in interest cost because of what's happening in, in the market today? And we almost doubled. So um, that 749000 you see, if we were waiting to do this now, we'd be budgeting over, over, over about a million four in interest <laughs> to do the exact same thing we did back in, in, in December of nineteen. So it was tremendous to say, I mean, no one could see this was happening, obviously, but because we acted as quickly as we did and stabilized the debt and stabilized um, the uh, tax base at the time um, and, and, and it grew the surplus since then, it puts us in a much stronger position here in 22 than we were in 2019 when we first uh, got involved. So I um, appreciate you, know, you, you commending them for making that move. I think also, Bob, too, you know, you're talking about <clears throat> net debt, you know, I'm looking at the net debt for 2017, it was 1.248, now here we are at 21, we're down into 1.123. Yeah, 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 the net debt percentage is, is, is a little lower than it was before. Um, obviously, you've had other things, you had fire trucks come up, you bought some land, um, but you're offsetting that by more rapid pay down. So you have a, you know, you have a larger uh, valuation in the town. You know, it's just like having a house with a $300,000 mortgage that was worth half a million dollars. Now it's about 300, but it's worth a million. So you have a lot more, uh, a lot more equity in the town versus the debt. Okay. Um, anyone else, John? John Walsh, have you had No, that was on the phone. <clears throat> oh, 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 sorry. That was John. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ellen Z. and Dr. Avenue. I have a question on the park and rec and how do you determine, because I didn't see park and recreation up there, and particularly the skate park that uh, will need to be worked on. Uh, this coming year, so can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the problem is with budgeting, and I'll just start it off the right. The problem is with budgeting is it's an unknown number until we get some of these companies to come in and tell us what they could do for us. Well, actually, I was asking about park and rec specifically because I didn't see it in the um, in the well, well, that comes under capital, doesn't it? That, that, no, park, so park, the state park would be in capital. That's all capital. Anything that we do for parks and recreation, right. capital, right? Um, well, some of the programs are are operational, so they are in the operations side of the budget. Um, Can you just specifically um, narrow it down to because I couldn't see in the budget the separation of the total amount and then how much is salaries versus investment in park and rec. Well, we have park. We have several different uh, park and recreation functions that fall under general operations. So, for recreation as a whole, we have one hundred thirty-seven thousand in salaries and fifty-two thousand in other expenses. We have the senior citizen programs, which have an apportionment of salary and wages, a thousand dollars versus expenses of eleven thousand. 
Um, the Harbor Commission is budgeted at $440,000 for salaries and uh, $137,000 for other expenses. Parks and Playgrounds is budgeted at $261,670 for salaries and wages and other expenses at this point is $50,000. So that's essentially the Parks and Recreations, all of the, the <coughs> recreation functions that the borough undertakes are fall within those categories. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Sandra. <coughs> thank you, Sandy Caputo, Sir Babineau. Please tell me the name of the engineering firm for the sidewalk project. The initial project? The original project. Is there a different engineer for another project? Well, there's the engineer who's been, Peter Abakian has been the engineer for the, the, the borough now. Right. And he was the engineer who was here. But the engineer for the program was Mazer Consult, Mazer Engineering. What a surprise. Okay. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Jerry. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Did you think you were going to get away with a, a budget <laughs> presentation and not have me get up here? Um, actually, I wasn't going to get up here, but I had a couple hours before the meeting, so I figured, let me take a look at what's what's going on here. Um, and I would like to I'd like to put a more historical perspective on some of the things. Uh, there's not too many questions, but just really for the public and for you guys. Um, the surplus is great, okay? Back in 2018, before this administration took over, the surplus was at $2.2 million. Today, we have a record-breaking surplus of $4.5 million, which is $2.3 million more than we had in 2013, or a 105% increase, okay? Um, and the mayor asked how how are we doing all this? Well, the easy answer is, if you all remember, we all got a 20 plus tax increase back in 2019. And we are all paying that 2019 20% tax increase every year. We paid it in 2019, 220, 221, and we're paying it this year, okay? It never went down, okay? So that's one of the reasons why the surplus is wrong. Uh, because, and I hope people understand this from a personal perspective, when you have more money than you need, like on your house budget, you really have to budget. I mean, it comes easy to budget when you know you have more money than you need to pay your bills. And that's what has happened here in Belmar. We've had more money than we needed. So the budget is really, in many ways, just a fiction, right? It's just numbers being put on a sheet but it's not really related to anything in detail, okay? Um, what bothers me a little bit, again, historically, in 2018, the general appropriation, or what I would like to call proposed spending, was $15.3 million. Today, the spending is $19.9 million. In four years, We've had an increase of $4.6 million in spending, okay? But, or a 30% increase, okay? So to me, that's significant because I don't have any idea where that money went. Right? I don't see it, it hasn't been explained, but all I know is my taxes aren't going down because spending is increasing. So it's like a tax and spend. I keep paying taxes, but more money is being spent every year, all right? And my question to myself is, is there ever gonna be a day when the taxpayers get a break and we get our money back, all right? Or are we just gonna keep spending, spending, spending? Okay, now. Oh, yeah. I know. Uh, this is my comment section. This is my comment section. Please, I haven't, I haven't asked a question yet. This is my comment. Um, Okay, 
So that's my overall budget issue. Now I just have a, 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 an easy one, uh, the beach utility budget. I noticed in the 2021 page, page 32B, it just says salary and wages, other expenses. If you looked at 2019, it actually said first aid salary and wages. Because I was looking through the budget and I was like, where's the first aid you know, salary and wages? And I couldn't find it until I realized that that was left out. Um, probably a typographical error. But you know, I noticed it's the same as it was last year. You're budgeting $112,000 for salary and wages and $40,000 for other expenses, okay, which was the same as it was in 2020. That's for the beach utility, right? So we have 152,000 for first state expenses to the beach utility. Then on our current fund, emergency services first aid, uh, this is on sheet 15, uh, we have $230,000 for emergency services first aid. Uh, the question I have is, at a prior hearing when we were talking about the EMS um, uh, being provided to other towns, it was mentioned that eight, I think eight full-time people had to be employed to do that. And I'd like to know where in the budget are those eight people? Where are those eight salaries? Because I don't see it in, in the first aid part of the budget. Because if, if, if it's here, it should go up, but I don't see any increase in the in the first day budget under the current fund. It's actually less than it was last year. So I'm wondering where those eight positions were budgeted for. Because um, in prior years, I had made a request, an open request uh, in, 19, in 2020, where um, I was told that the the, the first aid contribution at that year was 33000 and the amount given for first aid charged to the beach fund was 48819 So I'm wondering where those, where those positions are in the budget. I think they, they should have, we should have seen a, a, an increase in, in the numbers. And then finally, my comment on the debt. It's great that you're paying off the debt. Debt doesn't bother me, okay? But I want to get one thing straight because uh, there was a misunderstanding, not on my part, but I believe on the borough's part. And I'm glad to see that the user-friendly uh, sheet actually had this number on it. I want everyone to understand the gross debt as of 125.22, I'm just gonna round it off. 44.1 million dollars, gross, right? That's everything, school board, the utilities and whatever. The net debt was 21 million, 21.6 million. Okay, you agree with that? That's in the budget, correct? Since I prepared the budget, okay. I would yeah. say yes. <laughs> Last year, the from the annual debt statement, the gross debt was 31.8 million, which means from last year to this year, the gross debt went up 12.4 million, and the net debt from 20 to 21 went up, it was 18.6 million, and went to 3 million. Now, as I said, debt doesn't bother me because it's being used for things that need to be done long term in the town. It's a mortgage, right? But I like comparisons from apples to apples and oranges to oranges, okay? That's my point in bringing this up. I'm not concerned about the gross number of the debt. I just want the comparison. If we're comparing year to year, we need to compare net debt with net debt and gross debt with gross debt, okay? And those are my comments. Thank you. I think you neglected to go back to that 2019 when it rose to $57 million. But, um, 
I'm ready. To, I mean, you want to address some of the comments that he made about uh, about where we were and where we are now. I mean, I, uh, back then I paid two dollars and fifty cents for a gallon of gasoline. We we're up so uh, about five dollars. I mean, everything goes up, and uh, I think you guys are doing a good job holding the line on on what we have to have done and bringing in extra revenue and trying to meet the inflationary costs. So it's, it's nice that you know you get up here and you stand your grandstand and, and tell us what we're doing wrong. But um, you guys are the professionals. I have all faith in you, and you guys have been doing a great job of, you know, of keeping our town running in the right direction as far as the finances. I would I would have to say, Mayor, that there's not a lot of fat in the budget. We are budgeting appropriately for the functions to provide the services that the borough residents require and that this council wants to uh, preserve for the benefit of the borough residents. I, I can only say that this is, in my, in my opinion, and yes, I am biased because I prepared this document, um, this is a very responsible budget. And going forward, that would be our intent, is to budget appropriately and provide the services that residents need and that council wants to provide to residents. And I'll just, um, I'll just say two things. And, um, one of the questions about the emergency, the first aid, um, that you'll find on page 22 and 22A, which, you'll, which is where the other towns, we have in their local agreement, so the salaries are in that section that are offset by revenues. Uh, and I think I did in my comments about debt, did say that our debt levels, le debt level overall is relatively the same as it was. However, we are not growing debt. We are staying kind of static, but we're paying it down rapidly because we do know that we, since we came into office, we came into office that you needed fire trucks, you needed road improvement programs, and you bought some land, and those things are not increasing our debt. They are really keeping our debt fairly similar, 19, 20 million dollar net, um, because of the rapid pay down of the old debt. So we are, uh, I would say, treading water when it comes to the net debt level. Of course, our equity in the town is growing, um, and if we were still temporary, temporarily financing, um, we, we wouldn't be at 20 or 21, we'd be at 23, 24 million dollars. Um, so we are offsetting these necessary new capital improvements with pay downs of all. Bob, I think it might be helpful to review again your comments on the surplus because I, you know, I, a, a comment was made that uh, we should reduce surplus, which. Well, I think, I think I think I said earlier that, you know, one of your intentions was to create some surplus. It, it, it was an ad previously. So yeah, it has about two million dollars, and it should. And in my opinion, it should go more actually, because I think you should have more of a buffer. So it's about having a buffer. It's not about just you know raising a dollar because I'm spending a dollar and nothing left over. You do need to have a responsible um, uh, surplus to meet future needs, to meet the things we're going through right now with inflation. Um, it, it just seems like you know if, if it's inflation, if it's Sandy, if it's COVID, it just seems like every three years, two, three, years, something happens, right? So to, to not have anything to fall back on, what are you going to do? Well, then you're going to have to raise taxes constantly every year, not just once every three or four years, which you do have to do to the inflation. But then you try to make it steady after that. So, um, so uh, I, if, if if your surplus was fifty percent of your budget, then they'll say, you know what, you guys got a lot of surplus but not at 23%. And when it was at 13, that was too long. So reducing surplus and going back to that 13% debt level could, could potentially have negative consequences on the borough. It could. Okay, is there any other questions? Yes, Mr. Silver. Um, I don't uh, have too many, uh, any numbers here. But I just want to want to talk about some of the words that have been used here. Councilman Carvelli, uh, you use the word art as far as the budget goes. Very good word. My compliment. It's very artful. Uh, now about the, about the word uh, inflation that's been thrown around here. Inflation, in fact, as far as I understand it, is a tax. 
It's a hidden tax. It's, it comes from banks and loans and loans and loans and loans and everything. And it finally hits the public as we're noticing now. And I, I got a real bad feeling about where this is going as far as I, I have a feeling as we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, inflation. Now, this surplus we're talking about, we have two million some dollars more in a, in the in a surplus than we did. It, it's gone up. So, aren't, isn't the new figure inflated dollars? So the dollars, the the two million more dollars that we had have now than we had right. of the surplus dollars are worth X amount less than the dollars that were in there, correct? Well, and if you're going to do a time value of money and, 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 yeah. go, and go back three years, uh, maybe it's not a real two million, maybe it's a real 1.8. But, but, oh, well, you know, let's, not, let's, I mean, you could do that, if, uh, but, but I mean, but if, if, as far as you know, actual non-economically uh, massage numbers, it is up to you. 1.8 is a good, is a nice figure. It might be like, 1.4 maybe. I don't know, I'm not an Right, it's hard to figure it. And as far as equity in a house, selling, let's say, a $300,000 house for $500, same thing, correct? The dollar is worth X amount less. So uh, we got nothing here. But let me, let me address the council now for a, a little bit. Over the last year, since you've taken over, <coughs> Mr. Mayor and Council, I've noticed all over the town, more and more town vehicles. So we're paying down, you're saying to me and us, we're paying down our debt, but we're using an unusual way of doing it. We're spending more. That's, that's interesting. Well, I can tell you this, we don't have any more vehicles. Have we replaced some? Yes, we have. We've replaced some of the older stuff that uh, is not repairable anymore. But we have. We don't have any more. It's the same amount that we've always had. <laughs> All right. I'll go with that for now. But uh, one other thing, uh, Miss, I, I didn't get, I didn't, my eye didn't catch it. How much is the school budget? How percentage wise? How much is the school? Budget? Forty-one. Forty-one percent. Forty-one. That's correct. I hate that school, <laughs> but it's it's going to be on our back forever. I know that. But uh, that's all I got to say for now. Thank you. Anyone else on the budget? Yes, Bob. Thank you. Uh, Bob Lynch, 316, and Debbie Belmar. I'm always interested in revenue outside of tax, uh, property taxes, because those are the things that help property taxes. And there were a couple of things uh, that kind of stood out to me. Uh, under shared services, uh, last year, our revenue from shared services was about 390000 And this year, it's uh, 760000 so it's plus two hundred seventy thousand. That's correct. That's is a that, result of the EMS uh, taking on the EMS shared service. So those those are the monies that are going to be paid to us by Lake Como, uh, Manasquan, and Seeger. That's correct. So that's the bulk of that. Yes. And then within that shared service, where does police? Is police in that shared services too? Not in that. Not it, it's in. Uh, there is a revenue that? line on sheet. There's nothing new with that. No, there's no change in that figure, I don't believe. Just bear with me one second. I... I mean, the 270000 we're bringing in on shared services, we're going to use it to... We're going to spend that on salaries and it's operations. Offset. It's offset, and, yeah. and but just offset with the first date. <laughs> And, and the police is with the Lake Como's deal. They pay they pay twenty five percent of our police cost or something like That's that, right? Correct. Yeah, by contract. Okay. Yes. Um, 
And uh, there are two other things outside of uh, um, or other revenue streams. Uh, one was. Uh, One was um, pilot programs. They're, those are those revenues outside of property taxes, right? And payment in lieu of taxes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so we, we we budgeted two hundred eight thousand last year, and it's going up a little bit, two hundred twenty four thousand this year. It's yeah. it's only going up because the contract probably says every year they may pay a little more. That's that correct. Yes. And then, how many how many properties are in the pilot program? I would have to get back to you with the exact number. I believe it's some it's somewhere on uh, approximately twenty five. Twenty five properties. Well, because there are condos. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it, I mean, each condo is listed as an individual property. Okay. And then are there are there any apart are apartment buildings that would be on your pilot programs too? Um. I would have to get back okay. to you. I don't. I don't know the specifics of, of the uh, the programs. It, you know, pilot pilot programs are always thought of as bad, good. You know, a way to get revenue uh, because it all comes directly to the borough. There's, they don't pay anything to school tax. They don't pay anything to uh, county tax, right? About five percent goes to the county. Okay. Part of the, the pilot agreement that the county offers to towns, uh, and then uh, concession rentals. Uh, that's another source of revenue outside of uh, property taxes, and, and uh, it went down this year, like thirty thousand. Is there any explanation for that, or what are the concessions that are included in that concession money, which is well, I, I three hundred fifty thousand? The two concessions on the boardwalk, we had to rebid, and they didn't bid them as high as the ones that had left. So um, they have increases in them, but but I think this year we, we did they were they were uh, they were down from last year when, when the two were concessions left early. So and then we had to rebid them. But right. uh, I don't think the bid went up as high as what they were paying. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, Mayor. Yeah. Okay. It is. Are the concessions on the beachfront? Are they all the towns, or do they? Do we have to share that with the beachfront the concession money? I believe the Taylor Pavilion through the courts carved out the Taylor Pavilion. It does, it's not they, they claim that it wasn't part of the beach utility. Yeah, I, I think that, that that was one of the court cases before we got here yeah. that um, they were trying to pay for it through the beach utility, and uh, the judge ruled that no, uh, that can't be paid for. Uh, through the beach utility, has to be uh, paid through borough taxes, and so we get to collect that revenue. And, uh, isn't the other concession the Marina Grill, the Ninth Avenue Pier, or the golf? No, are they separate? Are they separate line items coming in? Because that is, uh, I don't know how they, uh, I know they have to pay <coughs> their own borough property, so I don't know where, where they are in the budget. I don't believe that that comes into us through the, the concession line. I would have to double check that and get back to you. Because I was just trying to see where that you know, like 380,000 and the beachfront ones are, I don't know what we get for those, but they're not anywhere near that, that revenue. So there's only, a, there's a few other concessions get, we have. I can get you the specifics. I don't, I, I don't have everything with me tonight, but I can get you the specifics. Okay. And then you were asking a question about where the, uh, the Lake Homo police contract revenue, it's on page 10, proceeds from police services contract. Okay, so it's in a separate line? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so I thought it sounded like that number was low for services, you know, other services, I guess, shared, other shared services. All right. And then um, I think somebody said that the cost of the sidewalks was $645,000 to end the, the the actual amount of money we paid to the contractor who put the sidewalks in. I believe, that, I believe that's what the engineer said. Okay. Oh, that's right. Um, so th that's going to be revenue that we're going to get this year. Everybody's going to pay those bills. I'm going to pay my bill. So does that show up anywhere? 
The 645,000? That's going, to, there's going to be a special assessment bill that you're going to get. So that's basically going to come back to the borough as a special assessment. And then that would be recouped and we would be able to appropriate that in, in a future year. So we're going to go, go in the revenue line. Well, it's not there now because there's no agreement. Yet. So, so you can't budget something that you don't. The state won't allow you to budget something which you don't have a document that says you're going to get the money or something you got in the previous year. This is still being discussed. So when that money comes in, it'll come in somebody probably called Myrna, but it'll be reserved again, uh, probably offset as a reserve to pay debt service because it's the money spent to do the project was done whatever, 17, yeah. 16, 17, and that was paid for through a bond. Yeah, there would have been a bond. Yeah. That was, was brought out first to pay for the contractor, and then now we're going to pay that bond off of the okay. That's correct. All right, thank you, guys. Okay, okay. anyone else? Yes, George. Sure. Yeah, sure. uh, George Collin Costello on the Third Avenue. Uh, First of all, I always repeat myself, I have so much respect for our service people, but on behalf of the school, I love that school. I went there, I graduated with Eddie. I worked there for five and a half years. The first two years I didn't even get benefits of a check. It was nothing, I drove the school bus. Mr. Wilson got me benefits. The teachers there, I don't know, maybe 20% of the state passed their time, especially with the starter students, not just them, but I love government school. Thanks, George. Thank you. That had nothing to do with our budget, but we'll <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else with a budget? Forty one percent. There you go. All right, April seeing none. Can I have a motion to close the public hearing? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, so now we have a resolution. It's um, resolution 107 to amend the 2022 municipal budget. Um, we'll be amending the budget and there will be another hearing on the amendment at the July 12th meeting. Um, so can we have a motion to um, adopt resolution 2022-107? I'll make a motion. Second. Is there a second? Yes, second. Councilman Brennan? Yes. Councilman McKinney? Yes. Mayor Wasper? Yes. Councilman McCracken? Yes. Councilman Carvelli? Yes. Okay. And just so it's clear, we'll be, we'll be adopting the budget on July 12th. That's correct. Budget. Okay. All right. So we'll move on. Uh, April, do you have any petitions? Uh, yes. I did receive one petition. Um, it's from Linda Sharkis and John Walsh, entitled Belmar Residents Against Overdevelopment. And you've all received a copy. Thank you. Uh, approval of minutes of uh, June 8th. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of the June 8th meeting? Motion. Second. Okay. Councilman Brennan? Yes. Councilman McKinney? Yes. Mayor Wilsifer? Yes. Councilman McCracken? Yes. Councilman Carmelli? Same. Okay. Quick council. Uh, Councilman Carmelli? Thank you, Mayor. Thanks. Uh, the planning board met on 6-1. There was one application. Uh, it was for change of use. Uh, that passed unanimously. It was actually to take over the barbershop next door uh, down on 12th or 13th Avenue on that street. Um, the Harbor Commission also met. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, fuel dock repairs. Uh, and I was also surprised to hear uh, about um, I guess the disrepair of the pilings uh, and some of the docks and stuff like that. So, um, want to come on that. I'm um, not going to discuss anything more about the field docking uh, today. But, um, and then there was the finance committee. Uh, they met um, last week. Uh, we're still awaiting appraisal on the uh, water and sewer system. So the big thing we're waiting on now is uh, I guess the town has to come up with a plan for removing the lead water services. Um, and so the, the big thing there is um, sewer, the water infiltration, groundwater infiltration into the sewer. That's, that seems to be costing us a bunch of money. So it um, seems like uh, we should have something more on that uh, in a couple of months. So those are 
those are those are my boards, and um, that's my report. Thank you, Council Member McCray. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, last night there was a Juneteenth concert held in the Teller Pavilion, which was sponsored by Belmar Recreation and the Belmar Library. It was a well attended event. Uh, it was not only a concert, but there was an educational uh, component to that. Uh, so I want to once again thank uh, Lewis and um, the Recreation Department, uh, Barry, uh, for putting on, on a delightful evening. Um, also, uh, I know that we've had a meeting since the last primary election, but now that the results are more or less official, you know, I'd like to congratulate everybody who's a successful candidate for their party. Um, it's, uh, it's not an easy move putting your uh, name on the ballot. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I just want to thank everybody who, who did that. It's part of our democracy, whether it's for county committee or county race or, or municipal race or whatnot. So congratulations to all the successful candidates. And then uh, obviously, um, just a couple days ago, we had Father's Day, and I wanted to uh, just recognize all the fathers in this room who are watching. I hope you had a, a nice weekend. Thank you. Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have no report. That's it. That's one of the Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we had an ADA meeting. I met with the ADA uh, group on um, uh, last week, and a couple things that we just wanted to confirm were just that there are movie mats at every beach, and that there are beach wheelchairs also at every beach. That's confirmed on the website. Um, and then there wasn't a whole lot else. Uh, the next meeting is not going to be until August 18th. Uh, recreation, the plaque dedication is moved to this Saturday. Um, do we know what time? 9.30. 9.30 in the morning. And that will be at the, the, the plaque dedication and the baseball game following that. Um, and also the movie, the Sandlot movie, will be that evening. And that's all going to be at the baseball field. Um, I was going to mention the Juneteenth event last night. That was a very nice event. We were, we were there last night. Um, thank you so much again to Recreation and the Library. Pretty much all the sign-ups for Summer Recreation are, are either full or you can still, I think, Junior Guards might still be available, but I'll be, all the other kids' summer programs are, are pretty much full, which is great. And, uh, and then... Okay. And then uh, just a couple things around the schools. Belmar Elementary, they graduated their eighth grade class on the 16th. Last day of school last week was the 17th. Um, they had some great school presentations on um, train safety, bicycle safety, and ocean safety, which was school-wide presentations. <laughs> Belmar's extended school year starts July 5th to August 4th. And they're having a summer enrichment program, lots of programs for kids. If you have kids or know kids that want to be involved, I saw art and dance and fishing and photography. I mean, really, really good looking programs that I'm gonna take advantage of myself, I hope, from uh, the week is August 8th to the 11th. Um, St. Rose High School, the girls and boys track and field won their sectionals for non-public B high school. So congratulations to them. And then the boys won the state championships for spring track and fields, which is great. Uh, St. Rose High School staff is integrating a stream. They're doing a stream professional development, which is science, technology, religion, engineering, art, and math, and we'll be integrating that into their curriculum for all of their classes. And then St. Rose Grammar School news, the eighth grade graduated, last day of school last week was June 9th, not a whole lot else happening right now in St. Rose, so pretty much on summer hours, everybody's on summer hours for the summer. And then that's all I have. Okay, thank you. And I also would like to uh, congratulate Lewis on a great uh, program last night. I, I know they're not easy to put together. And uh, one thing I have to say about the Belmore Library, uh, all year long, every different culture, um, they, they always have something going on uh, to recognize all the different cultures. And, you know, we live in a diverse community, so it, it's nice to see that uh, the Library of Berry puts all that on. Thanks, Lewis. Um, I attended the, the Belmar uh, Elementary School graduation. Um, one thing I have to say about that, I mean, uh, uh, I guess say that the school board, our uh, new uh, superintendent, 
Mr. Alvarez, uh, all the staff down there uh, really do an excellent job. They, they, and um, it was the first time I was in the new auditorium, mm -hmm. which they uh, refurbished all the old auditorium, and uh, the school really looks nice. It's a shining star of our community. Um, I know Mr. Dilberger has a different opinion, but uh, I think it's the shining star of our community. The kids were uh, well received, and uh, you know I want to congratulate our eighth grade students going to high school. Uh, like Mrs. King said, Field of Dreams is a Saturday. It looks like the weather is going to hold out for us. We had to cancel it twice because of weather, so uh, so it looks like uh, the third time we'll be able to uh, present the field and present the flag. Um, we have the laser light show on um, and fireworks on July 1st, continuing with our 125th year anniversary. The laser light show will be done from the Taylor Pavilion before uh, the fireworks show, so uh, it should be a nice, uh, nice uh, event. Um, if anybody's been by Silver Lake, the two new fountains that we have in there are lit up fountains now, so uh, we're able to change the different colors for. Uh, different things that we want to do, if it's red, white, and blue for Fourth of July, um, uh, they'll be able to change the colors, but uh, the, the, the fountains really do look nice and so like. And we're going to have a refurbished fountain. It's not lit up, but we're going to do one in Silver Lake. So, uh, and, or, I mean, uh, in Lake Como. So, um, that, that should be up and running, hopefully, this week, right, Bill? Uh, we're, still, uh, we're still waiting on prices to come back as far as electrical service. Oh, okay. and, uh, the availability on the panels and the boxes, so it might be a little bit longer than we estimated. All right, all right, I've been working on that. Um, and I just got to say, I know we're at the top of the meeting, and it's never easy for our first responders. You know, they do everything that possibly can be done to, to try to keep everybody safe. I have to commend them on the job that they did. There was 10 people in the water. They were able to get out nine. They didn't realize there was a tenth one in there. Uh, they worked uh, tirelessly to get the last one. Unfortunately, uh, it was, didn't end in a good result. But I really have to uh, commend them on the job that they did. They really were in the water right away and uh, rescued a lot of people. So. I think that's all I have. So we'll move on to uh, public session on any of the resolution items. Now, Patrick, we're going to do that one separate. Uh, Correct. <coughs> Correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Correct. I think if anyone would like to speak on one of the resolutions listed on the agenda, please step forward and state your name and address. Yes, Mr. Driver. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Eugene Beamer, uh, Fourth Avenue. Um, I hope I'm not uh, talking out of step here. But does this include all the resolutions on the sheet here? Okay. Um, I have a question on. Uh, uh, resolution number 2022-112. And this is a, a liquor license uh, for uh, flames uh, for the period ending uh, June 30th, 2023. Uh, the liquor license, uh, we've got some unusual wording here. Uh, it says uh, alcoholic beverage license with uh, broad package privilege. Um, can somebody tell me whether there's any other uh, establishment in Belmar that has a, a broad package privilege? I, I think all Class C, right, uh, Patrick, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Class C is broad <coughs> that they have either bar or package goods. So I think there's a few of them around town. There's, there's certainly a few of them around town. Um, the exact one which had a specific license, I honestly <laughs> have to check. Um, I would be surprised if, uh, oh my God, 
the white banquet hall on the corner um, that was just subject to the amendments to the redevelopment that probably has a broad package, yeah. package okay. privilege. I, yeah. I would have to double check and review each license to give you a definitive answer, but I would be shocked if it was the only one. <clears throat> That's the reason I'm asking the question. What specifically, uh, in other words, we have other on the agenda here, there are other uh, liquor licenses uh, for uh, for consumption, mm -hmm. but this one particularly uses the word broad package privilege. So the broad package privilege is actually a liquor license, which you're no longer, I'm going to use this term kind of carefully, permitted to issue new ones of. So the amount of liquor licenses that every township has, there are certain kinds. There's distribution and consumption, and it's regulated by the population. Now, every township or every municipality, um, at one point prior to the amendment to the various regulations, were all allotted a certain amount of various kinds, because Barrow, for example, only has less than 8,000 people in it. So under the current regulations, they would be permitted to have two liquor licenses for consumption and only one liquor store. That's all the amount of licenses that would be permitted to exist. But however, because they're grandfathered in and they have previously um, or prior existing uh, liquor licenses, they're allowed to be transferred from person to person. The reason why Flames has the broad package is because at some point they would transfer a liquor license where most likely they purchased it um, from either borrow being able and capable of holding in pocket or alternatively from another, <coughs> another individual who previously owned it. Okay, yeah, I, understand. I, I do understand the way that you go. These licenses, uh, you know, they've been selling liquor in Belmar for years, <laughs> uh, but there's a, a, a limited number of licenses and they are bought, sold, and traded. Correct. Uh, okay. Now, a couple, a year or so ago, uh, this, uh, this, this Flames uh, a restaurant uh, had a license that was not a broad package, uh, did not have broad package privilege. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know what the actual difference in operation is. Uh, does this mean that if you have a retail consumption license, yes, you can sell individual drinks to customers. Correct. Now, if they have a broad package uh, privilege, can they sell bottles across the bar? Correct. The answer is yes. I don't know if they would, but they are permitted to operate, oh, excuse me, to operate at a liquor store. Okay. Now that's a change in operation, isn't it? No, it's not. It's still it's still considered a restaurant establishment or, or inherently related bar use. So there's been there's been previous arguments made where a restaurant which was zoned in in an area where liquor stores were prohibited would similarly have a broad package privilege, and they tried an arguments made in in court was that they violated the municipal land use law because it was a use which was not authorized. However, the court declined to accept that argument because a liquor license is a liquor license in its eyes. Whichever license you have can be associated with your use provided that the primary function of the operation is not selling liquor, but instead is a restaurant establishment which specializes in food production. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I would like to know, do we have another in order to have a basis of comparison, do we have um, a facility here in town, an establishment that has this broad package privilege? I don't know if it's listed in any, 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 uh, any of the licensing that, that we issue, but I, I know from the state we see, Broad C um, allows that, whether it's in one of the regulations that we put in, right, April? Yeah, I, I think the I think we just used the real question. He just wants. I, I have to check. Um, I can review it and have an answer for you at the next council meeting um, to determine what, what the classification of the licenses are and if there's any other ones. But there's no. I can't give you the answer right now because I don't actually have any license in front of me. I don't know why you say yes or no. 
Yeah, this is the preferred, this is the best type of license, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, it's... Yeah, okay, in, in other words, uh, the, the owner can, can cheat the tax man. In other words, because the tax man doesn't know whether they sold individual drinks or they, whether they sold bottles of, of, of alcohol. Not necessarily true because they can't. Everything has to be accounted for. Um, by way of by, by, by way of example, most restaurants that have the Broad City, if they sell, we use Bud Lights, two dollar Bud Lights. They're not going to sell six pack of Bud Lights for four dollars. They're going to sell six dollars, six pack of Bud Lights for twelve dollars because then they're going to be losing income. And they'll do the same thing with a bottle of say Tito's, where Tito's for them. For everybody else, cost was it eighteen dollars? I think at the liquor store, maybe twenty. But they will probably charge five dollars a shot. So they'll calculate how many shots are in the bottle. I don't know. We're going to say twenty for using that, and they'll probably charge you two hundred dollars for the bottle if you really want that bottle. But I, I mean, it would be a business decision. But every cost would have to be itemized. They can't make it up as they go, or they'd be committing tax fraud. Exactly. <laughs> Um, that, that's what I meant, though. That the tax man doesn't know whether you poured individual drinks out of the bottle or whether you sold a, a, a sealed bottle. Uh, but that, that's not really what, what, what my concern is here, is that for a reason, this license was transferred, okay? Uh, and, 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 and in other words, we have two... Uh, Deliver licenses on the agenda tonight. Uh, one of them is uh, Jacked by the Tracks, and it appears that is the same corner as uh, Flames. Uh, but there's two different licenses. One has broad package privilege, the one that's now being associated with Flames, and the, uh, the jacked by the track liquor license there that is not going to have uh, broad package privilege. That's correct. Why did the, and it appears that the owner of these licenses is the same entity. Okay. That's Why, I think they're both broad C. I don't know if it's listing in a mark. Um, Jack by the tracks one? Oh, wait a minute. That's the season. That's the season. That's the season. That's the season. No, it's my mistake. Yeah, that, that's different. That's the season. Mm -hmm. So I misspoke. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, my question is, is why, why have uh, the uh, liquor license with the broad package privilege what was the intent of having that at Flames instead of Jack at the Tracks? I mean, what's the difference in the, in the actual license? Um, value is a difference. Uh, what what brings in? Honestly, at the end of the day, it's the owner of the entity's choice, but they also has to be in an available liquor license for them to obtain the value. The entity, um, the owner of Flames, and the owner of Jack at the Tracks. Because that then made the business decision because these liquor licenses are certainly not cheap, especially when you're purchasing, purchasing from another person, and realize that it just would have been a different economic investment. I don't know, I can't speak for him, but that was the liquor license that he was able to obtain. That's the liquor license that he um, duly applied for. That's the liquor license that he gets. Uh, <clears throat> there's no reason to prohibit him from having it, and the liquor licenses are exceptionally well regulated by the ABC. Okay, um, I, I guess where my concern is here, and, and there's also uh, uh, distribution licenses here, one for Hanley's, and uh, I guess at the last meeting we had the, uh, uh, oh, the little red barn, uh, they, they, they got their license released and also. Um, say for instance, though, that uh, <coughs> Flames, and by the way, none of these uh, resolutions here seem to actually spell out hours of operation. They do spell out playing of music and so on. 
but they, 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 they specify the powers there. But they, none of them seem to, to really outline or nail down hours of operation. And, and what I mean by operation is the actual sale of liquor. Um, now, Hanley's uh, may close at, which is a, a package goods store, may close at 10 o'clock at night. Does that mean that if Hanley's is closed, can I go to Flames, which might be open till 2 o'clock in the morning, and buy my package goods there? Yes, that is what that means. You would just be paying more, which is why I'll come back to the Bill White example of rather than <coughs> I have what's called the technology the idea of liquor store is not terribly certain, but you'd be spending, if it's a two dollar Bud Light, you're spending twelve dollars. Most likely probably five dollars. So you're realistically spending thirty dollars for a six pack of beer if that's what you really want. Okay. And and, and so this drug package license would allow package goods to be sold up to I guess last call or whatever the, the facility uh, the, the, the place had. That's correct sir. Yeah well okay uh, this actually gets more complicated than that. Um, we do have a sidewalk uh, cafe uh, permit to count mm -hmm. and, 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 and these appear there's no real mention of the permit here that mm -hmm. was issued to Flames or Jack at the track for that matter. Um, the licensed premises had been moved out into the street. Um, does that mean now that we can have, in, in addition to selling individual drinks, does that mean now that Flames would be able to sell uh, sealed bottles out on the streets of Belmont? <coughs> it would be. Sorry, a little bug. But uh, they would be compelled to sell within the confines of the patio section. So the way Belmar's ordinances are written is that you can get an exception if you would apply for the permit, provided that there's, um, I think it's three or four feet from the terminus of the, uh, so to say, call it a barrier or the <coughs> furthest most point of the tables. Um, the ordinance requires six feet, but it left it in the discretion of the zoning officer at the time. Uh, whether or not we should be granted to the form of three or four feet. Uh, when Flames did apply for the permit, uh, they did request the shorter end of it, So, it, and they were granted the permit at that time. So it, they would be permitted to sell liquor in accordance with their liquor license in that, in that extended area, yes. Okay, I don't, I don't have any, any more questions on this. It's just that... Uh, um, I, I feel that things have been extremely, made extremely complicated uh, with the extending out uh, the sale of alcoholic beverages into the streets of the town to all hours of, of the day. Um, you know, if, if, if that's what, what they want to do, I mean, that's that's what it is. Also, aren't we going to, wasn't a, a, a state just passed a, a, a law the other day to allow uh, carriages, in other words, people buck to buy, be able to buy alcoholic beverages and then mount a bus or a carriage. Actually, I think it's a pedal. It's a pedicab. Pedicab. Yes, yeah. I know exactly which statute you're talking about. There are various conditions that have to be satisfied. First, whether or not pedicabs are, are lawful within the municipality. Um, subsequent there too, there are significant restrictions, but the one thing that exists part of this statute is the municipality, if you have choice, you either authorize pedicabs or you don't authorize pedicabs. If you authorize pedicabs, this is not on. I apologize. Can everybody hear me a little better now? So the municipality has a choice when you meet the session. You either choose to authorize pedicabs or you don't authorize pedicabs. If you choose to authorize pedicabs that exist within the municipality, the municipality, per the statute, is prohibited from barring or not permitting the consumption of single single use uh, alcoholic beverages while on the pedicab, provided that the operator of said pedicab is 21 years of age or older, is not drinking. Seatbelts are provided, and there's one other 
So that one other restriction that I apologize, I'm lacking on my number. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else on the resolutions? <laughs> Can I have a motion to close the public session? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I have a motion to approve the resolution resolutions as listed on consent agenda number one? Motion. Second. Councilman Brennan? Yes. Councilman McKinney? Yes. Mayor Walsifer? Yes. Councilman McCracken? Yes. Councilman Carvalho? Yes. Okay, uh, next is consent agenda number two. Councilman Brennan will abstain. Um, can we have a motion to approve the resolutions as listed on consent agenda number two? So moved. Second. Councilwoman McKinney? Yes. Mayor Walsifer? Yes. Councilman McGrackin? Yes. Councilman Carvalho? Yes. Now we want to hear that one. Yeah, so the way it's going to work is I'll read the resolution, then we have a motion to amend the agenda to include the resolution that has to be first, second, there has to be a vote of council. Thereafter, a public comment section has to be offered after the public comment. Then we give the commander and council would vote to either approve or reject the resolution as read into the record. All right. <clears throat> so this is a resolution to waive the assessment and collection of engineering costs associated with Ordinance 2016-09 and Ordinance 2017-20. Whereas the borough of Belmar in 2016 adopted Ordinance 2016-09 and in 2017 adopted Ordinance 2017-20, parentheses collectively referred to as the ordinance, oh, excuse me, collectively referred to as the sidewalk assessment ordinances, uh, close parentheses, and whereas a preliminary hearing on the collection and imposition of the assessments listed on the sidewalk assessment ordinances was heard on June 16, 2022. And whereas the mayor and council desired to waive the collection of all engineering costs associated with the sidewalk assessment ordinances, now therefore be resolved that the mayor and council of the borough of Belmore does hereby authorize the waiver of the collection of engineering fees as costs associated with the sidewalk assessment ordinances. Be further resolved that the mayor and council instructs the commissioners of assessment to exclude from its calculation and report the total cost of engineering fees associated with the sidewalk assessment ordinances. <coughs> Motion. Can I have a motion to amend the agenda to include that resolution? Motion. Okay. Councilman Brennan? Abstain. Councilman McKinney? Yes. Mayor Walsford? Yes. Councilman McCracken? Yes. Councilman Carnell? Yes. Okay, and then we'll have public session on, on this resolution. If anyone would like to speak on it, the four state name and address. Seeing none, can I have a motion to close the public comment? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> and uh, can I have a motion to adopt uh, this resolution? And I'm sorry, we just have a do we have a way of just identifying the number of this resolution? Uh, it'll be 2022-116. And it's a resolution to waive the assessment and collection of engineering costs associated with Ordinance 2016-09 and Ordinance 2017-20. Do we have a motion to adopt the resolution? Motion. Second. Okay, Councilman Brennan stands. Councilman McKinney? Yes. Mayor Walsifer? Yes. Councilman McCracken? Yes. Councilman Carmelli? Yes. We don't have any ordinances, so now we'll just move on to public session. Yes, we will. Linda Sharkis, 4th Avenue. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to give you an idea of, for the people here in the audience, what our petition was about. All right, mm -hmm. what should that them be? I'm just, I'm just, real quick, I just have to put a little something on the record, because I did read the petition. And the petition that appears to pertain to a pending application for the zoning board. Um, am I correct on that? Um, it's it's in general, but it does reference a project on 12th Avenue. Yes. Um, the issue is because it's referencing an application on the that's what property for the zoning board. So to allow testimony on it. Now you're certainly entitled to talk. I just have to put this on the record for the mayor and council not to answer it. Um, it's not their purview. It's not within this this mayor and council's form. So the applicant for the full project has the right under the municipal land law to apply for variances from the master plan. One of the one of the proofs that they have to demonstrate 
is that there isn't a substantial deviation, and in addition to the uh, controller, you are able to speed. So when you have comments and concerns about the about a pending application, you have to go to the zoning board as opposed to the mayor and council, because the mayor and council's hands are effectively tied. They have zero authority to tell the zoning board what to do, and the applicant has a statutory right to apply for the variance relief to have a deviation from the requirements of the master plan and the existing ordinances as drafted by the borrower, and the borrower cannot prohibit or restrict that way. It's called um, field preemption. It's preempted by, by the legislature. We understand. Sure, that. yeah. So yes. we will, uh -huh. <laughs> we're going to talk about it then. You guys don't have to respond if you're not legally allowed to. But um, so Linda's going to read it out loud. So we, the undersigned of Belmar, have joined together to express our concern with overbuilding in residential areas. To date, there are no four story buildings east of Main Street. However, a four story building is being constructed on 9th and Main with apartments and first floor commercial space. And a four plus story condo building is proposed for 12th Avenue to replace a, a three story hotel. We believe that the intention of the master plan is clear and these types of development should not be approved. These types of structure place a burden on infrastructure, traffic, light, shadows, wind, noise and encroaches on neighbors' privacy. In summary, based on the master plan, no four-story structures are permitted in R, that's residential districts. These high dense buildings detract, detract from the general character of the, the borough. Would you want a, a four plus story building in your neighborhood? Or would you prefer a lower density neighborhood for you and your family to enjoy? We ask the yeah. members of the community. To so we had, we had about 314 signatures. It was on change.org. Um, we just wanted to let you guys know for future projects that maybe you have to decide on, especially between Main Street and Ocean Avenue. I mean, uh, there's an empty lot on our block. Um, our block, all three of us, 11th Avenue. Two. I mean, two houses. Well, it was one, no. and then no, it's now it's two. I mean, that would really suck <coughs> to, for that to happen there. I mean, so this was, there were some um, comments that were online. Um, I don't like the direction the town is going in. Um, we are a small, quaint town, not Hoboken. Um, sometime, um, I own a house in Belmar. I plan to retire here. I bought in this town because it was quaint and not overdeveloped and busy like other beach towns. Um, and generally, the consensus is to keep the small town feel. So this was just to let you guys know that there are many people like the two of us that are not here and do not come to the meeting that have the same feeling. So all, all I will say is just when those happens, do you come? Please go to the planning board. Oh, we please do. There's only board. We do, and no one listens to us. So we are in a last ditch effort to try to stop things like this from happening in the future. And I understand. Just so, the council can't. Cause you well, have, they can those, do stuff in the next project. No, so, they can't. It's, if it's an application for the zoning board or the planning So board. they can appoint better people to the zoning board, I guess. They appoint them. They have statutory terms right now. It's, okay. a, we're, it's a very, it's a very. So thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Randy Grisell, 11th Avenue. I appreciate your comments, and I understand the difference between the zoning board and what the council does. But I would like to talk about the zoning board. I'm a person that doesn't get intimidated very easily, and I've discussed this with you, Mayor Walsker. It is totally intimidating to go before that zoning board and make comments. It is not run the way that a board, that it is not a respectful place to be. You get belittled, you get talked over, you get, you, you cannot get your point across without being either yelled at, scolded at. It, it's, it's just an inappropriate thing. So yeah, it would be great to go to the zoning board. You go there and you are totally frustrated when you walk out of there because nobody is listening. Nobody is listening. I understand why you go before a zoning board, but there's still a, um, a framework that you're supposed to work within and you sit there and you sort of scratch your head when the people on the board are asking or not asking questions that clearly should be asked. So 
I implore you to maybe look at some of those trans look at some of those videos, read some of those transcripts to see what your board is doing because it's really inappropriate. It really, really is. Thanks a lot. Anyone else? Yes, John. Lewis. Hey, John. <laughs> I got the 14th of every Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> First thing, thank you for fixing the hole yeah. and for putting up the chin up bar. But the chin up bar in the hole is not for me, it's for the whole town. I know it is. And then the second thing is, because I just sit here, this is just an observation. I sit here listening, someone saying what a great job you guys are doing, and what a great job they're doing. Well, first of all, they're doing their job. That if they're doing a great job, they're supposed to be doing a great job. We're, you know, that's what they get paid for. You guys get paid nothing when you try your best. And we're all here, you know, I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't want a better job. But when I listen, what happens, I think, and this is in this country, is that these people have their view, you have your view, your view, and if you don't agree, it's, whatever, they, they did away with this thing called the Fairness Doctrine, where you would have to give, you know, uh, you, you like them, I like them, and then there's, you know, okay, we both heard your points. But, I mean, I listened to Katrina's view, I'm like, okay, that's your point. And then Jerry gave his view, right? And then, you know, I heard you say it was great. That's democracy. That's democracy at the finals. We here, we're airing our things out, we all want a better Belmont, but we all, you know, we have a different view on it. And that's all I got to say. I just said, you know, let's be civilized with this. You know, I don't agree with you. We can still be civil. That's all I got to say about that. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Lewis. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Lewis Palito, Belmont Public Library. Um, I want to thank you for those who were able to come last night. You met, it was a great event. I especially want to thank my partner in crime, Barry Drago, with the Recreation Department. It was a pleasure working with him to put together this really great event that turned out to be very well. So, uh, thank you to Barry. I'm sorry he wasn't here to hear it from you directly, but I'll tell him myself. Um, I wanted to announce a, the next uh, sizable event. It's going to be interesting all to us. It is a book launch event. Um, a local uh, a Jersey Shore based photographer has created a book is launching uh, very soon and we are one of four launch parties along the Jersey Shore the book is Sand, Sea and Rescue by photographer Gregory Andrews I have a flyer here for that and the, uh, the book launch event is July 5th, uh, Tuesday July 5th at Taylor Pavilion at 6pm so what's so special about this book is it's Sand, Sea, and Rescue Lifeguards of the Jersey Shore. And he went up and down the Jersey Shore from Atlantic City all the way up through here and photographed lifeguards in their element and made the stories about them. And it's a multimedia book because now for each one, there's a barcode or like one of those little um, uh, QR, code. QR codes, thank you, where you can like scan it and it'll bring you to like a multimedia thing online where you'll hear that lifeguard story or event. It's a great one, and the, what's, what's cool about it is, is it includes several Belmar life, lifeguards. Um, so we're having the event here. His name is Greg Anders. I have the flyer. I invite everyone uh, to come because we're going to be reaching out to all the lifeguards up and down the Monmouth County Shore. Our library was able to work with him and be one of four main uh, launch parties up and down the shore. There's one going down over south of uh, Atlantic City. There's one going on over in um, uh, Long Beach Island. We're, uh, and then they're doing another one in um, Point Pleasant for uh, Ocean County. And then finally, we're the Monmouth County launch party. So we're going to be bringing right. lifeguards around. So we'll welcome everyone to come to that. And I'll have this all up on the website as well. Um, John, have a copy of that? Yes. But we'll have that. Okay. Um, and we also, as I want to mention, is that we have two new story times for kids 
uh, age uh, in kindergarten through second grade, uh, Mondays at 10 a.m. and Thursdays at 3 p.m., in addition to our regular toddler story time. So for anyone with those young kids that need something to uh, uh, story read to them, come on down to the library, we will read to them. And we have some great activities for them too. And um, finally, the next summer concert is Let Me Be in the Deep Blue Sea on July 26th at 6 p.m. Tuesday night. So be there and enjoy. That's my idea. You know, recently we had the um, uh, the Danny White's uh, <coughs> Beach Music Studios band. Uh, Joni was there right there. They, weren't they great? They were wonderful. They were wonderful. Great. It was a beautiful day. It was yeah. great. Yeah, so just so you know, all these uh, all these uh, uh, programs, all these activities are free and open to the public, so come on down. With that, thank you very much. And have a good day. And just a little plug for Danny White, the Beach Music Rock Band, they're going to be in the plaza July 1st. That's Friday night, July 1st. So the kids are playing again July 1st. So thank you. Yeah, Okay, Mr. Zilberger. Uh, first of all, we're not we're not still commenting on the resolutions, right? This, no, we're done. Public session. Anything? Public session. Okay. I just want to clear, clarify something. I think that word "hate" is uh, very crass, but I used it. But I, I want to just extend on a little bit. I want to say I meant it only in the best way. But, <laughs> but uh, let, me, let me just comment on the school a little bit. I made a joke there, but sorry, it didn't go over too good. But uh, anything in my the way to look at it, single item, it takes over forty percent of the the budget is out of line. Something's wrong. That school has been running in the wrong direction for many, many years. It has very little to do with education and most mostly to do with the feeding of the children and this and that. And, and it, I've, all, I've thought this for a long time. The education is, the way it's presented to children is, is really uh, bad. The concepts that we, we use it. We're using concept that came over to this country in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s from Germany. We're still using that with these children today. That's what I mean. That's it's unacceptable. It's obsolete. The whole concept of getting up a story and going to a certain place to uh, to learn whatever the arithmetic and that is wrong for these children. They're not the children of 1880 or even 1940 or 50 when I was a little boy. It's a different world. Everybody's got their gadget now. Well, the teacher is up there in this front of the room. I don't have to be there. They're looking at their gadget. Nobody has to be there to see it. This is all wrong. It's the schools, not only this school, all these schools should be shut down in a moratorium put on for five years until they come up with a, an idea for these children. This is totally ridiculous. All schooling has to do now is, is vendors selling whatever they're selling, administrators, teachers, and whatever else, uh, bus drivers, of course we don't have much of that here in this town, bus drivers and everything else that has to do with the, the system. It's not about a schoolroom. A schoolroom is dead, it's done, and everything. There and that, there and that is what I hate. We should have moved on from, I don't know, 50 years ago, we should have moved on to something else. What I can't really tell you. I have ideas in my own head what would have worked with me, but I'm an old man now. And these things wouldn't work now, but they're certainly not working on these children. All right, I'll leave that. I got up here because uh, I am still uh, upset about that skate park. It should be open. 
concept of safety, we're always into the safety. Nobody wants to get hurt. So, nothing wrong with that. But people do get hurt. Just like down at the beach the other day. People got hurt, one guy got killed. These things happen. Certainly, as you said, the white guards and everything, they tried their best and they did a good job and all that. Fine. But people get hurt. It never went through your head or a hazard to, to shut the beach down, put armed guards to keep the people away from the ocean because they could get killed and hurt. Of course not. That's ridiculous. Uh, all right. At the uh, two weeks ago at the uh, Friday night concert, a woman got hurt and a, an ambulance came and car the raw. I have no idea. I guess she was all right. She hurt her leg. Uh, she fell and she hurt her leg. That's an injury. You want to shut the, the Friday night concerts down? What, what are we doing here? These boys love this thing. That's the only thing that they do in town that, that they always love. You put that thing up and they always always were there. You know, not on a rainy day or anything, but they were always there. It was always 15, 20 of those guys there. All the time, constant. And you shut it down and locked it up. Take the lock off. Damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Just let the boys have a, have a good time. Your, your alternate is, you see them around town, they go in parking lots. That's a heck of a place to, to do it and everything, and use their skateboards there. And, and they, you know, right on, the, on Main Street and everything. They, they're going to do something because they love that. But you shut that thing out. Please open it up. I used to like to see them doing their, their stunts and everything as they walk by. But yeah, you just want to keep it shut down. Now, all right, maybe you got some sort of action in mind that I, I have no idea of. All right, then that overrules what I'm saying now. But please open that thing up. Take the Jersey Pirates out of there. What, the, what kind of an idea was that to put those things in there? And, oh, yeah, safety. Remember a couple of years ago when this malarkey started with the COVID? They took the benches off the, off the boardwalk. What was that? Were you afraid the benches would get sick? What kind of action is this? Everything you want to do, you want to stop. Start doing something. Take the locks off the skate park and let them let them do, do their thing again. Of course, you'll get hurt. You get hurt all the time. Like I say, it's an act of it's, it's an act of God, and the insurance won't pay for it. Anyone else? Yes. Jane Salmon, 1613, uh, Route 71. Um, so I had a few things prepared. I was going to go through a whole timeline of what's been happening with the skate park from the beginning when it closed over a year ago. Um, but I know it's, it's getting late and I just didn't want to, I don't want to take too much time. So I'm going to just summarize some things. Um, back on May 3rd, we had a petition that we submitted to the council and I haven't heard anything about that, like where it stands. Uh, just as a reminder, we wanted to create a fund to earmark, uh, donations for the skate park in the budget. And also create a committee of community volunteers to work with the borough to ensure those funds go solely to escape court, scrape park improvements and activities. So I don't know what, what happened with that. That just kind of fell on deaf ears or got filed in the circular file somewhere, I guess. Um, we, uh, we were also told that the skate park is no longer under the jurisdiction on, of the rec of recreation commission, um, which I'm a little perplexed about, uh, but it's clearly listed on Belmar.com as one of the seven recreation facilities, so I'm not quite sure about why that is. Um, is it because of, you know, 
none of the recreation budget has gone towards the skate park. Is that is that why? I'm not quite clear on that. Um, one of the other things I wanted to point out is several times when safety was uh, cited as a reason for closing the skate park, um, we were told it was because the there were lawsuits and uh, you know the the GIF really wanted to close down because. Uh, there were safety concerns. Um, our research indicates there are zero suits on record against Belmar for the skate park injuries, for any injuries that occurred there. Um, perhaps, in theory, they say it enough, it'll be deemed true, um, but we haven't found any evidence to that fact. And we did ask you uh, if you can inquire with the GIF to see if anything was um, recorded to them. I did. I don't know if you want to talk now or you can. Sure. <clears throat> there is a lawsuit I have right here. Okay. And it involved a minor <clears throat> who suffered a broken leg requiring open reduction internal screw fixation surgery. Okay. AKA he really broke his leg bad. Okay. Um, the allegation was that it was a direct result of the dangerous condition, which was the skate ramps. The investigation revealed that the dangerous condition was in fact did in fact exist and that it was in fact the skate park. So yes, there was a lawsuit. Okay. Um, I understand your investigation revealed nothing. Mm -hmm. I can tell you for a fact that it exists because okay. I have it. I believe it. But <clears throat> there's enough detail to uh, yes. indicate that it's it's a fact. Okay. All right. But that was one. Mm -hmm. And it's been open since 2009. This was the this injury occurred on specifically one second in 2019. So this injury is what sparked the investigation into the condition of the skate park and subsequently okay. the closure. Okay. So again, the answer is yes that there's one, right. but it only takes one. And right, I understand that. But in, uh, what, so it's been <clears throat> 10 years, right? Um, and had one bad accident. No, this was in 2019, I'm sorry. I don't know. So the skate park was open since 2009? Oh, that's correct, yes. Right, so that's 10 years, right? Yes, but since that time, now the skate park, the skate park is on to the skate park. Now it is considered an ancient condition of public property, and therefore the liability is astronomical. Okay. So this type of injury, a lot of zeros. Okay. Um, and the status of that is still pending? Yes. That case was dismissed on technicality. Okay. It was a improper service and then the attorney handling it appeared to have missed the statute of limitations which for those who don't understand is the statute of limitations is essentially a fuse once that fuse breaks up there's no more fuse you can't trigger the complaint so they failed to properly serve the borough so the borough locked out there's no better way to explain it it was okay. an extremely unfortunate situation gotcha. <clears throat> Uh, I just also I wanted to mention that uh, previous at the previous meeting um, it was stated that by the mayor that Belmar had received but uh, is waiting to receive about four or five plans from uh, skate park companies um, and they will submit them to Parks and Rec for approval and then the approval plans will go out for bid um, but we haven't heard anything about a deadline. Uh, when, when you've given these skate park companies to present these plans to you, and at what point should the public be expecting to hear those skate park companies present at a future council meeting? Do Our we government know? minister has been working on that. Do you want to give an update on that, uh, Our minister? Yes, sir. Um, we've talked to Bricktown uh, <laughs> County for Long Branch. Um, other jurisdictions that put new skate parks in, we're waiting for proposals. From different companies, and then we're waiting for presentations. So we've got emails out, uh, we've had phone conversations. I just received some from Bridgetown yesterday, and we're trying to get everything together for a f uh, presentations for a further council meeting. Okay. Um, all right, so do you not have a deadline for the when, when that information is As soon as I get the information and I meet with the state park people, people that come down, they'll do a proposal. Uh, and we got to get some of the number that we're looking at. Uh, we got to make sure the overall safety of the ground down there at Dempsey Park is the right place to be. Um, so we're waiting on it. Okay, so, it's, it, it's, so you're saying it's possible it might not be at Dempsey Park anymore? 
We have to look at all options. I don't know where it's going to be. We've got to make sure that it's still safe enough for that foundation down there based on the condition uh, of how that's all uh, added in there. Uh, the blacktop there. That was one of the main conditions uh, that they found out. So, okay. and as regards to the lawsuit, you know, I, I know George Comitas is here. He testified. He talked to council how many injuries he's handled over the years there. So. Um, this is we're trying. We, we know how valuable the skate park is. We're trying to get the proposal together. It's a monetary issue. Um, like we've always discussed, there's a lot of money involved in, in putting a skate park in uh, to bring it up to, to code and bring it up to speed for 2022. Um, so we're working on proposals and then we have to make a decision based on uh, what the proposals come in. Okay. Uh, and I just want to reiterate something I've mentioned in other meetings. My group has offered to. Uh, fundraise, um, but in order to do that, we have to form a 5013C, um, and we're willing to do that. But we need a commitment from the town, and um, you know. We, we I've had this communication with you, and I know Patrick's here. You, we cannot allow you to take over a section of borough property mm -hmm. as as a, as a commitment. I'm not looking to do that at all. We're going to letter. help you raise the funds. Right. If, if, if it's we want, if you want to raise the funds, you've been saying that for a year now, we've seen nothing come in, but we can't give you a letter that gives you uh, exclusive rights to a skate park. You have demands in that letter that our lawyer reviewed that there's no way we can, as a municipality, agree to that type of uh, okay. letter. And that, that's what I talked to you about. All right. Um, can I just ask you a question? Yeah, How much sure. are you committed to raising? Uh, 150000 I mean, the... Uh, estimate was projected at three hundred thousand. If the town could match that, we've yeah. had several meetings over the past few months, and I know you're here at every meeting to talk about the skate park. And I know the mayor and council have told you that we value the skate park, mm -hmm. but there's priorities and infrastructure concerns that we have. There's money to be raised, and it's like anything else. We have to make sure that the taxpayers of Belmar understand what it will cost for the skate park. That skate park was properly funded years ago. Right. There's no taxpayer dollars in it. So it's a whole different thing. It's not under Parks and Recreation. Mm -hmm. I've offered uh, early on in 19 for somebody to take that over. Nobody would want, wanted to take it over. Right. Nobody wanted any responsibility of it. So we've had these meetings. I've met with you and, and the gentleman from the skate park, the skate shop, mm -hmm. and uh, you guys have suggested ways for us to raise money in piecemeal uh, a skate park with 10,000 here, 15,000 there, 20,000 here. That was and just one idea. Well, and, and the idea just, it, it's, it's about getting the funds to make sure we have a, a skate park that's safe and, and fits into what we need. Right. I know Mr. Dilberg doesn't agree with safety, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. So we're, we're, we're getting our proposals together. <laughs> we've worked on this uh, and we continue to work on it. We know how important okay. it is. It's just Can I you ask know, you another question? Yeah, sure. I know you're privately willing to raise $150,000. But oftentimes, as we as you've brought up in the past, these skate parks are really more of a regional park. Mm -hmm. It's not just for um, you know borough residents um, and kids come from. I don't know what the primary service radius is. Would you be willing to go to um, other municipalities and see if they would be willing to participate in all setting the cost of the park as well? I, I know you live in Wall, like you know. So I mean, but. I mean other municipalities too, since since this draws you know people from the surrounding areas. Is that something the group would be interested in? Um, I don't know. I mean, we've we've primarily been focused. Excuse me, <laughs> primarily been focused on Belmar just because it's you know the one that's currently in in danger of you know, has been closed. Uh, and I live in close proximity to this one, and that's the one my son has walked to since he was ten years old. So. Um, haven't really given much thought as to other jurisdictions. Thank you. Um, that's really it. Uh, just, you know, one point I just want to make, I mean, because we've been hearing for months that you've been talking to people, it's just, it doesn't have, hasn't felt to us or to me personally that we've gotten far. So I guess this is more information than we've had in a while. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else? Joe? Joe McAvoy at 700 Main Street. Just a stone's throw away there. But unfortunately for some people here, I don't live in a glass house. 
All right, first person I'd like to address tonight is John Sabian, multimedia director. John ran up here at the end of the last meeting two weeks ago and said, talked about how uh, everybody has 15 different jobs here in the borough. And I respect everybody's hard work and commitment. Any organization over 30 members, it's a 2080 rule. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I get it. I worked in the corporate world. It doesn't work like that in the Marine Corps, I can tell you that. I admire everybody's hard work, but let me just review for you. Because I'm getting sick and tired of talking about the flags as much as you're probably tired of hearing about it. Now, first of all, for months last year, the firefighters, veterans, they sent emails, they phone call, they talked to people in the borough to try to get lights on the war memorial between 11 and 12th Avenue. We did that for months. September rolled around. A group of the veterans approached me and said, can you speak on our behalf? Because we're not getting anywhere. There's no lights on the memorial. And we don't want to go up there. We don't have the temperament for it. Can you please go and talk on our behalf? And I didn't want to come up here. So the last thing I wanted to do was come up here. Because I hate public speaking. I want to vomit every time I come up here. One of the men has seven combat tours. What am I going to tell him? No. So the mayor gave a speech on 9-11. How you guys are bringing patriotism back to Belmar. It's made it about the flag and God bless America at 9th Avenue Pier. And they wanted me to come in soon after that in September. And I said, no, we're not going to use the flag as a political football. We're going to wait until after the election. And if it's not taken care of by then, I'll come in there and we'll, I'll speak on your behalf. They had a lot to lose. Businesses in town, families in town for years, they were scared. They had a right to be. A lot of people have been threatened in this town by certain people. So I agreed to do it. Now, before I did it, I guess it was late September, early October, Councilman Brennan, you had the dune plan, mm -hmm. and I volunteered for that, mm -hmm. right? Dug the holes for the trees and dune grass. Mm -hmm. John Sabia was up there taking pictures. He wanted to take my photograph. And I said, your, your bosses don't want to see my photo anywhere on Belmar.com. I said, but can you please do me a favor? And he said, what do you need? And I said, I'd really like for you, is there any way we can get lights on the flags at the Firefighters Memorial and the War Memorial? because we've been trying for months and we haven't gotten anywhere. And I said, what can you do for us? And he said, sir, I'll go back today and I'll put a work order in and we'll contact JCPNL and we'll hook up some electricity and we'll get it taken care of for you, no problem. One of the 15 jobs he said he would do. And he shook my hand and I thanked him and I said, God bless you. I appreciate it. And I'm sure he came in and he mentioned it and somebody said, I'll oh, screw that. They're dead, they don't vote, who cares? But he promised me and he shook my hand and he broke his promise. So I came in here on November 9th and I addressed you, Councilman Crack. And that's how it started. Joe, could you do me a favor? Yes. Rather than put yourself in these compromising positions, these people who are talking to you and asking you these things and saying that they're they're frustrated, we can't get they're not them. frustrated. They're scared. Could they you threaten? They don't need to be scared of me. Could you ask them to call me directly, please? I would be more call you directly. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. All right, you. we'll do that. Also, the May 7th council meeting disappeared from YouTube, just vanished. 
be nice if we can get that back up there. George, George, I said a few things about you at the last meeting, and uh, I wanted to say one one thing in particular. But I wanted to say to you personally, please, please, this is a public session. Well, I'm going to just guide you that you're now talking about private individuals, so you are creating a record, and if you're welcome to talk, Roger that. We can't, we can't prevent the okay. talking. Yeah, like, when they are private individuals. If he has issues with people that are employees, I think. I don't have an issue with them. Can I speak? It's a public open session. It's where we exercise our First Amendment rights. It's free speech, not nice speech. Not nice speech, free speech. Just asking myself a question, and you're welcome to talk. Please proceed. George, you weren't here. And I said a few things about you. I thanked you for all your work on the flags. I want to say one thing in particular, but I want to say it to you in person. You came up here and you said your big regret in life is that you never served in the military. Don't have that regret, George. My biggest regret in life, I can't be more like you. Understanding and loving and concerned about everybody. But it's not my nature. So part of the reason it's not my nature is because I spent so much time in the military. So don't have that regret, George. I admire you more than you, far more than you admire me. That's what I wanted to say to you. And I also remember the time we saved the life together. The bridge jumper off the Route 35 bridge when he blew his aorta off his heart. And the two of us saved his life together. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Councilman Brent. Good stuff. Good stuff for you. I promise. I received a call from uh, Colleen Palis on the Environmental Commission. Oh, from Colleen, yes. Yesterday. Yeah, she called me up and uh, spoke to me about the backpack blowers. Now, from an air pollution standpoint, you came from a, a noise pollution standpoint, but from an air pollution standpoint. Yeah, it was both. Yeah, briefly you mentioned it, and I never, it never registered with me, so I apologize for that. From an air pollution standpoint, these things are horrible. In fact, I read that you could drive a Toyota Corolla cross country and it would, it would put out less emissions and less particulates than if you ran a backpack blower for an hour. You could drive a Ford Raptor truck a thousand miles. Are you talking about a, like a gas power? Just the two stroke yeah. gas okay. power leaf blower. I had no idea they put out that much pollution. So if you come from a from an air pollution standpoint instead of a noise pollution standpoint, get that ordinance together and ban these things. Harvard linked air pollution to autism in 2017. And if you overlay autism with air pollution in the nation, it, it's almost yep. a perfect overlay. Yep. It's unbelievable. And uh, but I mean come at it from that angle, nobody can argue with you. <clears throat> Councilman McCracken. <clears throat> November 23rd, last year, after I spoke on November 9th, three people up there, I won't mention any names, one of them was you, promised me that flagpole would get painted by the summer. Summer started at 0541 today. Now, you know, I still have faith in God, country, and poor, but I don't have any more faith in it. I'm sorry. No, listen. Not I'm done in 30 seconds, and you can talk about my mother. Now, the councilman, please consent to continue. I'm not so sure that I said by the summer. I said this summer. I followed up on that a couple weeks ago when we were there for the Memorial Day parade with the, or not parade, the Memorial no, Day it's not parade on Memorial Day. The Memorial Day commemoration where we chatted, spoke to DPW, it's told it's on their list, couldn't get it done earlier in the spring because of the weather, it's gonna be done. So 
Got to get it done. That's all I got. I'll see you in two weeks. Anyone else? Can I have a motion to close the public session and adjourn the meeting? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out.